All right, so we are going to talk about the basics of vegetable gardening here in Central Florida. All right, now there are some very, very basic things that are universal to all planting and gardening activities, right? But for today, let's talk about vegetable gardening. And yes, it is a very different process from what you would use for your ornamental gardening because you might intend to consume some of these things yourself. And so there are things that you would use, there are techniques and methods that you would apply that would not necessarily be as beneficial to you if you were doing the same thing that you do for your ornamentals, you use them for your vegetable gardening, okay? So location for your bed. Right plant, right place, Florida friendly landscaping principle number one is major when it comes to vegetable gardening. You need a spot with full sun, okay? That means that the sunlight is going to be beating down upon that plant in that space for at least six hours out of the day. So that means your south facing spaces, your western facing spaces, and your eastern facing facing spaces should generally have, if there aren't any obstructions, full sun, okay? Your north side is going to be trickier. The north side is the area now where that's almost always going to have some type of shade and you will have to gauge that yourself, move it a little further away from the building or not put it there at all, yes? So that is something that you need to consider. Now, another thing that I know some people don't think about is proximity to water. This is Florida, you all. We are called the Sunshine State. If you ever want to fry anything, just throw it out there. It will get zapped. You need, and, and, and you need to water it. And unless you intend to get every single step of your day in doing your vegetable gardening, please put the location of your crops proximate to water. All right. I've seen where there are some very dedicated people who drag their watering cans from spigot way on over to some garden bed. And I'm like, that's not sustainable. And then they call me and they're like, well, Nikki, there was a problem. Yeah, you need to bring your beds in or take your water out. But something has to give in the middle there. Yes. So make sure that you have proximity to water. That is important. I have a really great hose reel, right? We play relay with the hoses and we hook them up. So that's what I've been doing. Of course, my yard isn't super big either. Make sure that you're planting your things away from competing roots. So I wouldn't necessarily tell anyone to put it underneath their live oak tree anyway, but if that is the only space that you have and you are trying to grow something in the ground, that might be an opportunity for you to put in a raised bed. That might be something that you might want to even say to yourself, ah, I'll just use pots because I don't want to fight with the root systems. And another great tip, whether or not you're using, whether or not you're doing vegetable gardening or you're ornamentaling underneath a plant with a big root system, start small. You don't have to dig a big old hole and fight with all those roots if you're starting small. So four inch, a gallon at the most, you can just step on the shovel, rock it back and forth, make you a little hole, drop your plant in and move the shovel, buzzing, it's planted, right? And you can't do that with a three gallon size because then that's, you know, you've got to dig your hole just the same depth, but two sizes out. Don't get into that kind of warfare with the tree. One of you will win. Okay, so well-drained soil is another thing. Most vegetable crops do not want to have wet feet. They do not like that water remaining at their roots. And one of the reasons for that is because there is a chemical exchange going on there, and that chemical exchange requires a level of oxygen, yes? So you must make sure that that is allowed to happen so there should be some water but the water should not remain 
at the roots, um, displacing the oxygen that the, that the roots also need to do these chemical reactions, okay? Um, and for those of you who live in HOAs, one of your locations might be that you can sneak beautiful cabbages and kales into your beds because they have pretty leaves, but they're still edible, right? So if you live in an HOA and you've got some spaces around your little hedges and different things like that, that's a really smart place to put some of your prettier leafy vegetables. And most of the times there are zero complaints about those things. Okay, most of the time. Holler at me if, if, if it fails. I might share some space with you. All right, so let's talk about having a plan. Any of you watched the A-Team? Yeah. And there was a guy named Hannibal, and even when things went straight offline, at the end he just winks his little cigar and he says, I love it when a plan comes together. What plan? Everything went sideways, right? But you gotta have a plan because you're not a, a, a one hour TV show, right? You have to have a plan for your investment of time, your investment of your other resources, your money, your yard space. And real estate in Florida is not cheap. Don't we all know it, right? Yes. So make sure that your timing is correct, all right? That's major. I just gave you all a handout that I made a couple days ago when I was thinking about how am I going to teach this class and give you all something that is going to be really valuable. That's what I came up with. Right here, right now, at this day and time in Florida, these are the things that you can grow. And you are almost going to be completely successful if you are using these methods, right? The timing. And one of the reasons for timing is not simply the temperature range that these plants require, not simply the amount of sunlight that we're currently having at this time of the year, but you wanna get in ahead of the pests that might want to predate upon your plant at a certain phase in its growth, right? And you also want to make sure that you get some of this last bit of really, really good rain to send your crops forward so that when we have a little less rain and it's a wee bit cooler, your plants are not super struggling, okay? That's one of the things. And so you wanna start your warm season crops early in the spring. Y'all don't laugh. Florida really does have the seasons, okay? There are some temperature ranges here in central Florida especially. And when we say warm season, that's what we mean, right? So you wanna start those crops early in the spring, okay? And then your cool season crops, you want to start them early in the fall. We started seeding out our plants in July and August, and we've got them in the ground already, especially our tomatoes and our bell peppers and our eggplants and things like that. That window is closed for right now. If you've got them mature already and you wanna put them in the ground, just watch them, baby them for a bit, monitor them for a bit, and you'll be fine. And then the next go round is January to February for those same plants. And yes, if any of you are from up north, you know that we're starting to shut down our growing process, right? And there's truly one growing season during the warmer times. That's not the case here in Florida. It is always warm enough for you to grow something that is edible. Whether or not you want to eat it is another question though. That's the thing, right? Because not everybody is fond of okra. I might grow it for the flowers. And then I take the okra and I make a little trip down south to my favorite aunt and she makes something called cuckoo, which is a mixture what you all might call polenta, I call turned cornmeal. And she cuts up the okra really, really small and she puts it into the cornmeal. And it is amazing. So if you're not keen on the slime from the okra, get you some grits, yellow grits, large grain. It's amazing stuff. But I'm too lazy to make it and I wanna spend time with my aunt. That's my story, y'all. All right. Summer is also 
the time that most people just turn over their beds, right? And if you are rotating your crops and you don't feel like putting okra in your fence line or you don't feel like running sweet potato vine along the ground in your walking path, that's fine. No one is forcing you to garden in the dead heat of summer. There have been other descriptions for summer here and I can't say them because I'm being a professional today. I had my coffee, right? So um, I recommend that if you are going to not do any cropping in summer, that you encourage your pollinators to remain with you by putting in sunflower seeds, by putting in zinnia seeds, by throwing in marigold seeds into those beds and let them get covered up with those flowers so that the things that were helping you before still feel like they're still wanted and needed and they still have a place there, okay? Now, why am I not telling you to put beans in there? Because you are rotating your crops. So if beans are the next in this bed, then by all means, put some beans in there. There are lots of beans that can go in there. However, in a bed where the next rotation is not a bean, sprinkle your mixture of seeds and let them cover up that soil for you. Because Florida is very efficient. She does not allow for her soil to just be there bereft. She will send some things in there to cover and hold the soil together for you. And because you are a good gardener, you have really great soil and those plants are gonna thrive in there. And then it's going to be very difficult for you to displace them eventually, yes? And I am telling you all this and I'm not calling them weeds because weeds are a classification that we humans have made for those plants that we prefer not to be there. However, those innocent plants are there to help you. And if you do not want their help, do not show them that you need their assistance, right? That's what I'm gonna tell you all. So that's what I have to say about the weeds, the unwanted plants. Yes, honey, yes, I'm there with you, yes. All right, so let's talk about maximizing your garden space because not all of us, including me, are living our dream lives on 32 acres. And I don't know why I came up with that arbitrary number, but I said 32 acres of land where you have a lot of space to grow a lot of things, right? And you would be amazed, I was, my first year of gardening and I put in about 15 plum tomato plants and 13 um, slicing tomato plants. I did not expect that much produce. I had no idea. And my two robust sons who were still growing, we could not finish everything that I actually had making for me. So I was the produce person in the neighborhood. And my neighborhood was with people who had nothing less than five acres of land around them. <laughs> so be careful. If you've got five tomato plants, you've got plenty if it's only you or only two of you. But maybe if you've got, you know, half a dozen or a whole dozen of you, maybe five tomato plants might be a good start. So be very careful about the quantity of plants that you are trying to manage. But if you are like me and you have limited space, okay, there are ways to maximize that space. One of them is using a trellis. Please put your trellis to the north, okay? Put your trellis to the north because then it's not gonna shade out anything that you really, really want to have, okay? If you put your trellis to the south, then all that south-facing sun is gonna be blocked. And any of you who know anything about basketball, you don't want anything getting blocked, yes? That's not a good deal for you. And then you don't want it to the west and you don't want it to the east either because it's going to create way too much shade. And there are ways that you can make a plan to even rotate for the trellis area. Not everything has to be just the beans or just the cucumbers. You can put in your tomatoes there because sometimes you need support for your tomatoes as well, yes? So there are ways for you to even rotate around your trellis if you make a plan to succeed. All right, into planting, you can put long and short season things together. Two things that are really fun are the carrots and the radishes. I especially like radishes because, well, it's almost instant gratification in every single way, right? Have any of you ever made a radish seed necklace 
We do it with the small children when we do um, activities with youth in, in, in public. If you get them in the morning and you have a little Ziploc bag and a cotton ball and a few radish seeds, you wet it up, close it up, that's their personal greenhouse. By the end of the day, they've got leaves. Look here, y'all, the first time I did that, I was worse than the little kids. I was like, do you see my leaves? These are my leaves. Needless to say, I am the person who volunteers to do that every time. Every time there's an opportunity to do radish seed necklaces, like sign me up. Was I supposed to be going on vacation? We can skip that. <laughs> I was just gonna be here anyway, right? So be careful with your interplanting. Um, trellis your bean, your summer beans on your corn stalks, yes? Run your pumpkin vine into your corn stalks. Now, is that not the three sisters planting that you read about in school at some point? Yes. Does it work? Like gangbusters. But you're gonna run into something when you stop and you say, how am I gonna rotate this? For me, it's not hard because those are my summer crops and I don't necessarily put them into my regular beds that I'm rotating. Corn is just too hard for me to be fighting with in a bed, right? I put corn on the outside. I let my pumpkin vine run on the outside. So it was easy to drop my beans in there. And the great thing with that combination is that grasses are heavy nitrogen pullers because they've got all that green that's going on. And your beans are heavy nitrogen fixers. So they're just hanging out together. Here goes the bean setting up the nitrogen. There goes the corn sucking it right on up and the bean gets to climb up and hang out with the peas. And then the pumpkin is running right along, shading out the root systems of the corn and helping them to be able to keep more water. Because you don't want to be always having to go out there and be a slave to the irrigation of that area, right? So these are things. So you're basically mulching with pumpkin vine and then you get to eat it. And I'm doing a blog on pumpkins um, at the end of this month, actually, and I put up a post on Facebook. I need some ideas for things that people do with pumpkins. There are lots of interesting things to do with pumpkins, and I didn't know it. I either just boil it, roast it, or eat it in pie, but there are lots of things to do with pumpkins. All right. Um, and then, of course, there are ways that you can add joy for yourself into your garden and increase productivity, right? So you're gonna plant zinnias and marigolds and other things that have really, really bright colors with your plants that you want fruiting. So stick, excuse me, stick some zinnias in with your tomatoes and your bell peppers. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna call your pollinators to these plants because they generally have very inconspicuous flowers, right? They don't stick out. Right? So they have to have some help. Let's direct some of that traffic towards them. So when you put zinnias in there, they have really, really bright colors. Those are the colors that your pollinators see, okay? So you're gonna stick some zinnias in there. You're gonna put, and, and I've trellised my cucumbers on mammoth sunflowers. And not only is that just something that you just wanna always go into your garden and see, but it's also really, really great for your cucumbers. They just grow on up the sunflowers and the mammoth sunflowers, they have stalks, I kid you not, that are like this thick. They are huge and it works out very well, right? So these are the things that you might want to do to maximize the space and the utility in your garden. And of course, if you've got zinnias growing out there, you're gonna be out there all the time. If you've got your sunflowers out there, Check it out in, in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, and it tracks the sun for you. When we showed that to small children, they were like, the plant moves. It, it is so nice. It is so nice. All right. Um, container gardening. If you are honest with yourself, have a conversation with yourself before you decide that you are going to be doing any kind of gardening to figure out the best way for you to do it, okay? A raised bed is also a container. 
yeah, you made a container, you put some soil in it, that is still containerized gardening, all right? That area is still relying on you to do everything. However, if you need a table because you cannot get that load down, or you need to do some sort of super raised bed, be honest with yourself about your ability to safely engage in gardening. Maybe you're gonna make yourself some bigger pots and put them on a table or something. However it is that you can safely do this is the best way. Please do not get caught up in what this person over here is doing versus what you can do. You're both gonna have tomatoes. That's the goal. How you get there, lots of winding roads. Enjoy your scenery, okay? Be realistic and be honest with yourself. I know that I don't want to be out there arguing with herbs. I've got them in planters on my deck. And that is more convenient for my son to run out there when he's cooking as well. Snip, snip, grab, grab, run back in, okay? Those are easy. Do we not have a bunch of beds? Yes, but most of the time the herbs are on the deck. Be honest with yourself, figure out how you want to do this. What is the best way for you to manage this endeavor? Because it is a matter of safety. And then it is also a matter of efficiency. And my goodness, I want you to have a great time. And a great time is not laying down on the ground in your yard acting like you really should be out there when you know you shouldn't. Set up a table, put a few containers up there and have a ball, all right? Um, lots of transplants and I want to encourage you all to make friends while you're gardening. Sometimes when you get plants from places, there are three tomatoes in there. There are two cucumbers in there. That's a really great way to make a new friend. Say, hey, I'm buying the tomatoes this year. You're buying the cucumbers. Are we going to grow them separately or are we just going to exchange starts? How do you want to do this? I'll bring you cucumbers. You're going to bring me tomatoes. But it's a way for you to find common ground if you were not already here, if you already don't have a social network set up. This is a really great way to be introduced and introduce yourself to somebody else, okay? I'm rather poor at it, but a couple of my neighbors have children. <laughs> children are the in. All right, so right plant, right place. Let's look at the last circular that I gave to you all where it is a long list of things that you can possibly grow right now. All right, so on this list are a lot of the cooler season leafy crops, okay? And I highlighted two that are time sensitive because we are currently in October. So you wanna make sure that if you want onions for bulbing, you get them now and you put them in now, okay? And I put onions to the edge of my beds because they're not gonna get rotated out immediately with my current season because they take a wee bit longer, right? So you want to put those things that, are, that need two seasons worth of growing to the edges of your beds. That way when you're pulling out things in the middle, they don't get, they're not collateral damage. All right? And onions are not things that you have to rotate, but I would encourage you that after you've exhausted one bed with your onions, then you move them over to another bed anyway. They're in the lily family and they are doing a really great job Sometimes they're, they're, they act as sentinels for, your, for some of your crops and they discourage other things from coming in there because of their high sulfur content, all right? So that is something for you to think about. All right, and another thing that's sensitive here are strawberries, okay? So if you've ever wanted to grow your own strawberries, I have three plants and I'm getting more. I might, just a little. And I have a dehydrator. And did I mention I have rabbits? And do you know how much rabbit treats with strawberries cost? Y'all, I am very mindful about my money. 
very mindful. All right, so I'm getting more strawberries and I've got to get them in the ground by the 25th. That is not an arbitrary number, all right? That is a number that those of us at University of Florida IFAS Extension have worked on. We've researched it and we've gotten it down to September 25th to October 25th is the window if you are in central Florida, and we are, for you to put in your strawberries. You are going to have a better time of it. They're going to be robust enough to handle a frost or two if you end up with it, right? And frost care, you all please water your plants in the day before you're going to have a snap or a freeze overnight. Okay, what that does, if you get out there first thing in the morning, which is what you should be doing anyway, and you soak the ground, not the leaves, okay, if you're going to water correctly, you want to soak where the roots are absorbing it. The leaves are not drinking it. The stomatas are going to take it in from the air regardless, but you want to soak the ground, okay? You don't want to overhead water your vegetable crops because then you're encouraging things that already want to show up in your in your beds so try to water in your plants give them a really good soaking give anything sensitive a soaking if you have orchids don't take them out of the trees you just want to soak that space where they are because under the trees canopy is a new buffer and it gives you about a five to ten degree window as well so you want to soak the areas where your things are and let them take in as much sunlight, as much heat throughout the rest of the day as they possibly can so that it turns into a heating blanket overnight when it gets, when the temperature really, really falls and, and some of your more sensitive things are gonna be in jeopardy, right? So, um, speaking of watering, your new plants, okay? Your new plants are going to want one inch of water in little bits throughout the week. So if you put in a drip line or a soaker hose, which is what I would recommend, or if you're, if you're using your wand or your hose, get underneath the leaves of your plants and water the soil at your, at your plants, right? Do not wet your leaves. That's an invitation for fungi to show up. And here in Florida, they don't need it. They don't deserve red carpet treatment from you. They're gonna show up anyway, okay? So try to discourage them as best as you possibly can by keeping the water where it is most useful, by putting it where it is most efficient. So you go out every day when your plants are super young and you give it a little sprinkle at the roots. Every morning, and the window for that is, you cut off at 10 a.m., okay? And I've seen and heard even county places that have sprinklers running at night, like when it is dark. Your plants are not in that phase of their utility of water anymore. So what's using that water if the plants aren't using it? All the things you don't want. Because nature is efficient. It will not go to waste, right? So water your plants first thing in the morning. For young plants, you want to put one inch, just a little sprinkle here to keep you going, a little sprinkle here to keep you going. And you want to have them stay nice and upright, right? So they'll have enough water that they're not wilting. But you don't want to give them too much water that they're not stressed out enough to spread out their roots. A little bit of adversity, right? That's when, that's when you've been showing your kid how to tie his shoelaces and he still hasn't gotten it and you let him be frustrated for five minutes. It's okay. He'll learn. It's the same thing with your plants. You want them to have a little bit of stress so that their roots will go out and be as robust as they're supposed to be. And then when they mature out, when they're done with that little, here I am, poor pitiful me, when they are grown, then you want to say your mature plants, they need two inches of water every week, but then you're going to go out there maybe every two days, maybe every other day, and give that a really good soaking. Because now you have those roots that are way down there in the soil, right? So then you're going to want to make sure that you're sending the water 
far down into the bed, far down into your pot, whatever it is that you're growing in. You want to have that water deep down in there where your roots are supposed to be now so that your plant can still be healthy, it can still be thriving. So what happens if your plant is wilting and you go out there and you water it really, really nice and deep, you've given it a good drink, it perks up in about an hour later, it's back to wilting. Then you've got a problem, right? Because you've just eliminated the, the idea that it's wilting because you didn't water it enough. Yes? And one of the bigger problems that we have here in wonderful Florida is we have nematodes. These are little, these are microscopic worm-like things that act like trolls in your roots. They block it off and they say, you, sh you will not pass unless you pay me toll. But then they don't let it pass. And your plant is suffering, but you just watered it. So I encourage you all that if your plants were wilting and you gave it a really good drink, it perked up for a wee bit and then it immediately declined again, pull up one as a test. Let's get a look at those roots. Do they look like there are little balls, little pearls, little things hanging off of those roots? And if they are, cull everything. Yes, get everything out of that bed and call me. Because we're gonna have to figure out a way to remediate that soil. You can grow other things in there, just not that particular crop or any of its cousins. So if it's a tomato plant, you don't wanna put bell peppers in there. You don't wanna put eggplants in there. You don't wanna put Irish potatoes in there because they're all family. They're all in one family, okay? And one of the things that I have dealt with is the people who say, well, I put bell peppers in there. They're all Solanaceae. They're all gonna have the same problem. You wouldn't have known that because you thought that bell peppers were very different from tomatoes, right? Some of the ways that you use them is significantly different. However, they're not. And who would have told you that Irish potato is also in the tomato family? But that's what it's in, it's Solanaceae. And I see some light bulbs. Bing, 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 bing. So that is one of the reasons why when we encourage you to rotate your crops, we say, put your families together. That way, if one family gets attacked, it's not your whole garden, right? That's a way to isolate an incident and not have that reverberate throughout your, your garden. But what happens if one day you go in there and everything is browned out? It's not just this family, it's all your families. Then that is not something that is, that got in there. It's not a, it's not a bug, unless it's a cat. Cats don't care, right? And dogs will dig up your mess. But, but besides them, then that might have been something that was sprayed and it blew in onto your plants, right? That might be an issue with if you've got some drip lines and you thought they were working, now you know better, right? So that would be some kind of environmental issue and not necessarily just a disease or an insect pest that came in and was affecting one family. Please don't think that fertilizer or a pesticide are the only answers. Those are tools in your arsenal, but those are not your only answers, right? So when you fertilize, your leafy crops, they want nitrogen, right? Because you want them to be nice and green, you want them to be able to make more green. So you wanna give your leafy crops nitrogen. All right, and then for your beans and peas, they don't necessarily want anything they're nitrogen fixers. They just want a good drink of water, sufficient sunlight, and every now and then you go check it for a bug or two. They're gonna be fine. If you start them off with a wee bit of fertilizer, that's fine. I'm not gonna tell you not to give them a good push start, right? 
because that's, that's perfectly fine to do. But generally, they don't need any more help. And Florida Friendly Landscaping Principle number three is fertilize appropriately, right? So does that mean no fertilizer? That would not be a sustainable method. You want to fertilize your things appropriately and your beans, your legume plants are generally not needy. And then you've got the things that want to produce fruit, okay? So root and fruit crops, they need more potassium as they develop, right? And what is our soil deficient in? Potassium. Like if you've ever seen a, a palm tree and you look up in the fronds and it looks like there are little sparkly yellow things, that is a sign of potassium deficiency. And then what beats all is when they butcher them and leave like four of those deficient fronds up. And it looks like when you scraped a little kid's hair and put one little bow in the middle. That's so unfortunate for the palm tree because not only was it already hungry, now you've taken out more than half of its kitchen and cafeteria, right? So potassium is not something that is here in abundance in our soil. Phosphorus, we mine that here. So when you are getting yourself a fertilizer of any kind, try to keep that phosphorus number as close to zero as possible because you don't need it. Unless you test your soil and you find that you have the one spot in Florida that is super duper phosphorus deficient and you, unless you're intensively growing something in the agriculture field, you should not have a phosphorus deficiency. But potassium, boy, look, it's, it's, it's a big deal here. And I've got people who I've encouraged, when you chop down your banana suckers, just lay it into the bed, cover it up, and let that go ahead and break down or you throw it, you cut it up into small pieces, throw it into your compost pile and let it break down so that you've got some residual that, you know, recycling the nutrients that are in your landscape. And that I think is Florida Friendly Landscaping Principle 7. I'm learning them. I'm experimenting on y'all, right? So those are the things that you're gonna have to focus on when you decide that you are fertilizing appropriately. And you should fertilize your vegetable crops. You should fertilize your fruit crops, your food crops. There isn't anything wrong with the judicious use of fertilizer. That does not mean that you are going to be polluting the lagoon or you're going to be making it what you're going to use adequate amounts. You're going to read the label. And let's be clear about that label. That label is a legal document. And when you purchase these products, you have engaged in a contractual agreement with whoever it is that you purchase the products from, yes? So whatever company that is, you are now in contract with them to use their product the way they said it is labeled. And if you're not using it according to the label, you do not have any recourse. You can't sue them if you went and burnt down your landscape using it incorrectly. And that might mean the wrong rate, that might mean the wrong time, that might mean the wrong crop. Read what you are using because it is a chemical, especially if it's a chemical that ends with side, which means it is going to kill something or it will make you very uncomfortable for a few days. It might not necessarily kill you, but it'll make you uncomfortable for a few days. Be very careful with that. And some of you are a little bit older than I am, okay? If you have not noticed and if you have not made yourself very aware, your skin is a little thinner than it used to be. This is your biggest organ. This is a huge membrane. This is a large surface for if you, are sque if you are spraying anything, if you are applying anything, those things are gonna get into your skin and they will be absorbed into your pores. Be careful about the ways that you utilize anything, okay? Be it benign soap and water. 
If you are spraying soap and water in an effort to kill something, then you need to be careful about the way that you are using that as well. It might be the lowest level of toxicity, but it is still toxic. So be very, very mindful of the ways that you are approaching whatever it is that you are doing, yes? So let, let's, let's move on to the ways that you are going to manage your pest issues. Integrated pest management is when you are going to look at your toolbox and say, what are the tools in my toolbox? Some of the tools in your toolbox is Indian River County Extension Service. We are a resource. Bring us your bugs, bring us your plant parts, take pictures, send them in. However you want to engage with us, we also have a Facebook page. University of Florida Master Gardeners of Indian River County is a whole page. And there's also a page for Indian River County Extension. If you send us messages with pictures, right? We are very responsive, bless the Master Gardeners hearts. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very good core of people who are curious and generous with their time and knowledge, okay? And the best thing is when it's something that they haven't seen. And then they get to share with everybody, especially me. And I appreciate it because they will have forgotten more than I will ever learn about gardening. They've been doing it longer and in more places, yes? So we are a resource. If you're trying to grow tomatoes and you tried doing it last summer and it just didn't work out and you're wondering why because your cousin in New York had gangbusters, call us. Engage with us. We'll tell you all the other things that you can grow until you can do your tomatoes now, right? Um, and then another tool in your toolbox is definitely the identity of your problem. Not every insect you see is causing the damage that is there. Sometimes, because you're a good gardener, and you put flowers in there, and you have been watering where the water is only on the roots, and you've been fertilizing where the fertilizer is only going to the roots, then you have not created an area or a space where the things that should want to live there with you and be friends and garden helpers with you are not there. So be careful when you squish every insect that you see that you are not eliminating a friend. Identify it before you kill it. Now it's easy if you know what a tomato hornworm is, grab, squish, drop it in there. It's fertilizer. It's a great source of, and if you've got chickens, chickens love them. I wouldn't recommend you eating any of that chicken for a few months later, but that's just me. I'm a little strange, all right? But yes, identify your pest, okay? And then figure out how do I, how is it safe for me to deal with this? What is the best way for me to deal with this? Before I started this talk, I told you all, about a client that came into the office and she was 90 some odd years old and she had a lot going on, right? She had the care of someone else still. If she did not have that much going on, I still would have given her the same advice. I gave her the name of a specific chemical and I told her to go to her box store and buy a spray of death. And I told her to just play zap with those critters. I was not going to deflate her bubble and tell her that those plants were way past utility and they should have been dead two years before. Those were her happiness, okay? And besides that, she's gonna need that spray bottle because she's gonna try to grow tomatoes again. And I don't want her bending over, culling tomato hornworms. That would be very foolish advice. That would be a good advice that she just can't take. Use the method of control that is best for you. And if you cannot bend down over 10 tomato plants that you overplanted, 
and you don't have enough friends, okay, then go get yourself something that is going to assist you to safely manage those insects, right? Now, another thing is maybe it's just past the time for that plant to still be in that space. You forgot to rotate and I'm obviously big on rotation, yes? Because rotating is a tool in your arsenal for controlling pests. So maybe the occurrence of that pest is, is, is a way for you to say, oh, the calendar flipped three months ahead, four months ahead, and I was too busy just having great tomato sandwiches. It's time for me to pull this out, okay? Use the method that is safest for you and for the rest of the environment. Escalate accordingly. So pulling them off didn't work. Okay, I've gotten news for you. I'm gonna spray you down. I'm going to let loose a, another biological thing, right? I'll go get me some ladybugs. They'll get those aphids. I, if you've got aphids, try to even out the battle and get you some troops, okay? There are ways to manage these things. Make sure that in all of your responses to things that are happening in your vegetable garden, that you stop and you say, is this still feeding me in many ways? Is this still a good thing for me? And I know that sounds like a very wishy-washy thing to say to you, but I want you all to know that there are many farmers who are still farmers, not because it's a great living, but because they just love doing it, right? We've had presidents who've said, well, farmers know they're not gonna get rich. So I want you to think to yourself, is this something I still wanna do? How can I do this better? And if you already don't have a gardening notebook or a gardening folder, make one, okay? Because you need to be able to keep track of your trial and errors. You need to know what you sprayed last time so that you can rotate whatever it is that you're spraying this time. Even though it worked, you don't want them to get used to it and think it's fruit punch next time, yes? And then you also want to keep track of what didn't work so that you never buy that again. Did pulling them off work? Or did just going in there with a conquering army work better? Keep a track, keep a note. I know we humans, we think that our CPU is always going to work and it's always going to keep track of everything. Y'all. It's really cool that you think that, but that's, that's us being the natural hypocrites that we are. We think we are so much better than we really are. And that's fine. You should be your biggest fan. Just be kind to yourself when, while you're doing that and get you a notebook and a folder. A folder for all these handouts that I've just given you and a notebook that says, this worked, this didn't work, okay? All right, so speaking of handouts, I wanna to talk to you all about some of the things that you all received today. So I want you all to grab some of those copious amounts of paper. I chop down many trees when I'm teaching, doesn't it seem like? There is electronic access to all of these things. I would like, if you are um, technology inclined, to access some of these things online because then there is even more that you can use them for. So I want you all to look at the publication that says Central Florida Gardening Calendar. Is that what it says? Yeah. Yay, see, y'all, I know my publications. All right, so what I want you all to be aware of with that is, that is everything a homeowner wants to learn and know about everything to do with their landscape. It tells you about what you can do with your ornamentals. It tells you what you can be starting. It tells you what you can be actively growing. It gives you tips on what pests to look out for. If you ever wanted something to help you make a plan to succeed, 
this is your publication. This is it right here. It even tells you when to be on the lookout for chinch bugs. Like it's everything. And then if you access it online, all of those blue highlights, you click it and you go to more resources, okay? And if you follow us on Facebook, we actually put up what's growing in a particular month. And you can look at your highlighted Central Florida. But this is a really, excuse me, really awesome publication. It helps you with your planning. It tells you that if you are planning on doing some vegetable gardening in the fall, now is when you want to start these seeds, right? Or now is when you want to drop these things in the ground. It is invaluable. It is an awesome publication. And yes, I harassed the folks at the county mailroom to print it off for you all in color because who doesn't like color? Who doesn't need a little color in their lives? All right, now there's another colorful sheet, one sheet of paper that you all should have. And that says to you all, here are the families and a rotation plan. Yes? And then you'll know that there are more colors up at the top bar than there are in the rotation plan. And that is because the colors in the top bar are giving you the list of families of things that you can possibly grow that can be eaten. But not all of them have to be rotated out. Or they're just not the kind of plant that you want to put into a space that needs rotating anyway. So like sweet potatoes, those take a long time and they tend to be persistent. <laughs> they tend to be persistent. And that is me being tactful. Yes, all right. So then I want you all to think about Solanaceae are your tomatoes, right? Amaranthaceae are like your, your spinach. And there is one thing there that the name of it is different from when you look at the vegetable gardening guide, and I can't remember what it is, but just cross match the actual plant crop with the names. Oh yes, Chinopoidaceae are the beets, and that's a different thing on your colorful sheet with your crop rotation recommendations, okay? So you just write it in on your tables and on your rotation chart so that you, you know that we scientists, as we learn more, we share more. And it just looks like, wait, you changed your mind. No, I just learned more. I've gotten a better handle on this, okay? So it's a great way. Do you have to have five areas? No, you don't. Do you have to grow beans if you don't like beans? No, you don't. But the recommendation is there so that there is a big enough gap between when you put tomatoes in this space and when you revisit that again. And if you're doing it like me, it'll be three years. Three years before tomatoes go back into that pot, that raised bed, that spot. Three years, because I cover crop with flowers in the summer. And that's a big, that's a whole entire growing, growing time, okay? So if you cover crop with those things, if you put your beds to rest in the summertime, then it's gonna be three years before you put anything in the tomato family back in the same spot. And that's gonna be helpful to you because the things that love to eat tomatoes, that signature will have disappeared completely by then, okay? Due to things that are gonna make your life easier, I love crop rotation, so if you come into my office or you send me an email or something and says, this is this bed, that is that bed, these are the things that I currently have and I didn't have this before, I'm gonna help you figure out how to go from here. I was talking with her earlier and, and, and I explained the ways that we meet people where they are and help to improve them from there, yes? So if you've already got your beds going, that's fine. And if you've got tomatoes growing with your cucumbers, that's fine too. I'm going to help you figure out who gets that next rotation and then what do we do afterwards? If you're mixing your families right now, it's fine. We're not, we're not putting up the bat signal yet, right? So 
You can still rotate. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're just going to have it in a smaller space. But the idea is the same. Okay? No matter how you're growing, rotating is a very, very big deal. All right? Composting is another thing because our soils are, no are notoriously poor. Try to compost if you can. If you need some help, I am here to help you with that. Okay? Absolutely. Now, another handout that you all have is I printed off the tables only from the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. These tables give you a breakdown of what you can possibly grow. That's the first row crops, yes? Then it says, depending on where you are growing it, this is your best window to put it in the ground. So if that is your best window to put it in the ground, you wanna give yourself six to eight weeks if you're starting those seeds. So that you have nice healthy starts. Or you'll also know if you're just gonna go buy you some. <laughs> the rain drowned my seedlings. All right, um, so that's really good. So we default to Central Florida because even though we are a cusp county and some of our county is technically over that line that we humans have drawn that says South Florida and Central Florida, we are the northernmost eastern county in South Florida and we are the southernmost eastern county in Florida. So I try to default to Central, dabble with South, ignore North for most things. North is not your window, okay? So dabble with South, try to default for Central, okay? Having said that, then you're gonna get, you're gonna see where it gives you like, how many plants for that space. The rule of thumb if you're square foot gardening is one plant per square foot, but we also know that it's 18 inches for a tomato plant. But what if you only have a 12 foot plant, a 12 inch planter, stick your tomato plant in there, just baby it a wee bit, you're still gonna get you some tomatoes. You will. You just have to give it more care, okay? That's what that is. Our scientists are really cool people. They, that page there is another table and what that has in it are the crops that are recommended, and the types, the varieties that we've tested, that we've abused in a lab and in a field. And if you all know anything about the University of Florida, straight up and down the turnpike, 95, 75, there is a sign for one of our spaces. And that is, and, and oh, I-10, sorry. Sorry about the folks in the panhandle, but I call that South Georgia and Alabama anyway. But um, there is a University of Florida facility somewhere in Florida that is testing the same thing. We want to know if we're gonna recommend this only for the South. We want to know if this is invasive in the North. We need to be able to address these things because these are things that are going to improve the quality of your life. So when we give you a recommendation for a variety, the time of year to put it in the ground, believe me, we've killed many plants. We've done the hard work for you and with you. And that's what you've paid us for. And please do not be shy about accessing our things, right? If you want a hard copy of anything, you come and ask for it. You don't have to use your printer ink. I will print it off for you. If you're new to Florida, I have a welcome to Florida kit. Yes? And if you still think you're new to your landscape in Florida, not necessarily new to Florida, and you want help, I have that. We are here to give those things to you. So again, right, that other table not only gives you notes on what varieties you can use for that particular crop, but it also says to you, hey, maybe you want to plant a few seeds every two weeks if you're growing arugula so that you're not having boom and bust, right? And it also says to you, the plant is spent when this occurs, okay? 
Those are really useful notes. I wish I'd known not to plant 78 lettuce seeds and, 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 and put them in the ground all at once. That would have been really good for me to know. And it would have been great for me to know not to put that much collard and turnips in the ground as well. But I lived and I've learned. I am staggering. Every two weeks, I go ahead and I put some more into the trays and I, I've got my little step system going on. And it's the same thing like with your corn, there are windows. So unless you want 32 ears of corn all at once, then you're just gonna say to yourself, okay, I'm just gonna put this much here. And then you'll be able to say to your friends, every three weeks barbecue at my house. <laughs>